Okay, this is part two for AP Biology, chapter three. Um, we just talked about carbohydrates, now we're going to talk about lipids. Um, lipids are fats. They're defined primarily by their physical and chemical properties. Um, and they're way different than the other macromolecules. Um, they're heterogeneous. They're soluble and nonpolar solvents, um, which means they do, do not dissolve in water and they're hydrophobic. There are five types of lipids we need to go through, triglycerides, phospholipids, glycolipids, steroids, and waxes. So the first one is triglycerides. Um, triglycerides are fats that are solid at room temperature, or they would be oil, which are, is liquid at room temperature. Um, the structure is important to remember. It is composed of one glycerol, three fatty acids, bonded by an ester linkage, through a dehydration synthesis reaction. So the bond is called an ester linkage. Um, if there's double bonds, it causes bends in the chain. They are storage molecules. Okay, so here's the picture. Here is your glycerol. Actually, this I like this one. This is your glycerol right here. Here is your ester bond. And then you have, in this one, you try for a triglyceride, you would have three fatty acids. Notice if there's a double bond like an oleic acid then it causes a bend in the molecule. Um, here's another picture of the fatty acids. Um, fatty acids can be either saturated which is shown on the top, unsaturated which is the middle one, and polyunsaturated which is the third one. A saturated fatty acid has no carbon-carbon um, double bonds. It's all single bonds here. It's saturated with the um, most amount of hydrogens possible. Um, unsaturated fats, like oleic acid, has that carbon-carbon double bond in it, which causes the bend in the molecule. Um, if you have more than one double bond, then it's called polyunsaturated. All right, another class of lipids is the phospholipids. Phospholipids are composed of two fatty acids. One of them is saturated, the other one's unsaturated, and it's also linked to the glycerol. There is also a phosphate group and a molecule called choline. In a phospholipid, they're hydrophobic tails and there are hydrophilic heads. Um, because they have both parts, a hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part, we call that amphipathic. That's a key term you need to know. Um, and phospholipids, as you learn in regular bio, make up the cell membrane. Remember, there's two layers in the cell membrane, phospholipids and proteins, and we do have a whole chapter on that. Um, here's a picture of the phospholipid structure. The choline structure, okay, is a nitrogen compound. You have your phosphate group right here, and your glycerol, which is similar to the triglyceride. And then you have two fatty acids. One of them is unsaturated, and one of them is saturated. And here is the phospholipid bilayer structure, which we all learn about in chapter 5. Um, in a phospholipid bilayer, their heads here, which are hydrophilic, are oriented on the outside of the membrane, and all the hydrophobic tails are in the middle. This is in your book. Okay. All right, another class of lipids is the glycolipids. They're similar to phospholipids, except there's no phosphate group. And they have, they have a short carbohydrate chain, and they're also associated with the cell membrane. Um, they have to do with cell communication, so you can see one right there. Okay, um, another class of steroids, or another class is steroids. Here is a steroid here that's cholesterol, which is a steroid, and cortisol is another steroid. Um, notice the structure, it's very distinguishable. It is composed of four, one, two, three, four, linked carbon rings that have a hydrocarbon tail and sometimes they have a hydroxyl group attached to it. Um, they're important in signaling between cells. Okay, The last group is waxes. They're similar to triglycerides except there's no glycerol. Instead it's an alcohol which is a little bit different structure. They're found in many living things that need to conserve water like insects, secreted, plant wax, fruit skins. Alright, the last macromolecule that we're going to really focus on for chapter 3 is proteins. 
There are many functions of a protein. They can be enzymes. They can have to do with structure, storage of nutrients, transport, um, cell regulation, movement, and protection. Okay. Um, you need to know the structure, though. The structure of the protein is called amino acids. Um, amino acids are bonded together by a peptide bond, and so we call proteins polypeptides, and they're just a bunch of amino acids bonded together. Um, all amino acids have the same structure. They have a central carbon, and then, you, as you know, carbon has four bonds. All of them will have a hydrogen. All amino acids will have a carboxyl group, and all amino acids will have an amino group. And then the last bond is an R group. And an R group is any variant, any kind of molecule can exist there, as simple as a hydrogen or it could be a big, long, you know, hydrocarbon. The amino acids are all the same except for that R group. The R group is different in each amino acid, and that is what's determining what type of protein it is, the physical and chemical properties of it. Um, amino acids, there's 20 of them naturally occurring. You do not have to memorize that this is asparagine and this is glutamine, but you need to recognize that these amino acids are polar. Polar meaning that they have this oxygen here. Oxygen is usually an indicator that the molecule will be polar. Um, and so that's how they're grouped, is by the chemistry of their R group, which is here in the beige color. The polar amino acids are going to be hydrophilic. Here are ones that are charged, electrically charged amino acids, and that's because they have, you know, ions. They're, they're charged, electrically charged. Here's these ions here for their R groups. These ones are nonpolar amino acids. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of them, um, and that's because they're mostly hydrocarbons coming off for your R group. Um, amino acids are bound together by a peptide bond, and this is done by the same process as the others, dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis removes the water bond, removes the water to form the bond, as you can see right here. Here's glycine, and here's alanine. They remove the water right here. The, o, the hydroxyl group is taken off the carboxyl, and the, another hydrogen is taken off the amino group, and that forms your water molecule. And then because of that, we form a bond between the carbon and the nitrogen right there. That is called a peptide bond. Okay? If you have one peptide bond, then you made a dipeptide. If you have two peptide bonds, then you have a tripeptide. If you have more than two peptide bonds, then you have a polypeptide. And this is all done by dehydration synthesis. There are four levels of structure in proteins. Primary, which is the string of amino acids. Secondary, which is caused by hydrogen bonding. Tertiary, which is folding of the R groups. And quaternary, which is more than one protein being associated together. I'm going to go through examples of these. This is a primary structure of a protein, and all it is is based on the linear sequence of the amino acids that are present in there. Um, if you change, if you just take this asparagine out, it would change the shape of the protein and the function. Secondary structure arises because of hydrogen bonding between oxygens and hydrogens. It can result in two different shapes of the protein. It can be helical, which is called alpha helix, and these type of proteins are elastic, like keratin, or it can be strong and flexible and have like a folding within it. The chain is actually folding back and forth, and that's due to amine groups and the carboxyl groups, or these hydrogen bonds. And for example, that is silk protein. Um, so I'm going to show you a picture of these. Here is your alpha helix at the top. As you can see, there's hydrogen bonds occurring here, and that makes the protein get this kind of shape. And then you have your beta pleated sheet, and you can see all the hydrogen bonds occurring here, and that makes that folding structure. Tertiary structure, you have more than different kinds of interactions occurring. You have ionic bonds occurring between positive and negative ions. You have hydrogen bonding still occurring. You have disulfide bonds, which are bonds between sulfur groups. And you have hydrophobic, so you got some repelling going on. And because of this, the protein is all in a 3D shape. Okay, And it all has to do with those R groups. And so it's caused by hydrogen, ionic, disulfide bonds, and van der Waals bonds as well. Quaternary structure 
refers to multiple proteins interacting together by the same type of interactions for tertiary. Um, each polypeptide on its own can have a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Here is an example of quaternary structure, like in hemoglobin and in collagen. Um, in hemoglobin, you have four different um, proteins here, and they're all interacting. And in collagen, there are three pop polypeptides all twisted together. So this is quaternary, when you have more than, more than one protein, basically, um, interacting there. Um, the last concept is denaturation, and this occurs when a protein unravels and loses its shape. It can be caused by pH changes, cellular environment, um, hydrophobic environments, concentration of ions in the solution, and heat. Um, for heat, it usually can destroy it at the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And in heat, it usually irreversible damage, so that's why having a high fever is very dangerous. Um, mutations also can damage the function of a protein, such as sickle cell, that causes sickle cell anemia because that's affecting the hemoglobin, the shape of the hemoglobin. Um, there are three types of proteins, binding proteins, structural proteins, and chaperones. Binding proteins take specific shape and that allows them to bind to other substances. For example, hemoglobin is a binding protein because it binds to oxygen. Structural proteins are like collagen, which are long fibrous molecules. They're the principal component in our connective tissues. Um, then you have elastin, which is gives us um, stretching ability and elasticity in our skin. Loss of elastin over time causes wrinkles and bagginess. And then keratin, which is found in our hair, nails, outer layer of skin, and then in animals, feather, and claws. Um, chaperones mediate the folding of proteins, and they are still studying this, but they believe that there are molecules called, proteins called chaperones that are kind of making sure that the proteins are all not becoming like complicated, aggregated, mixed up together. Okay, so there is a fourth macromolecule called nucleic acids, um, which is your DNA and your RNA. Um, for this chapter, we're not really concerned about it. You should be able to recognize it, but you don't need to know any of the details that the chapter goes into because we have a whole unit on it later on. Okay? Um, but basically, it's just knowing the difference between DNA right now and RNA. Know the name of the structure. Know the functions right here. And then the structure, they're made of nucleotides. And there's three parts to the nucleotide, a pentose sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. And that's your picture right there. So this is what a nucleic acid is made up of. Nit um, sugar, nitrogen base, and a phosphate group. And that completes chapter 3.